The key to the next revolution in physics has been hiding in plain sight for over a century. Let's find out what that key is here on Inductica. Imagine a glass jar with a bell in it. If you shake the jar, you'll hear the bell ring. If you pump the air out of the jar, you will no longer hear it ring. This is because sound is a wave consisting of expansions and compressions of air. Remove the air and there's nothing to expand and to compress. Now here's where it gets interesting. Light is also a wave, yet we're still able to see the bell after the air is sucked out. Light waves are still reaching us through the air. If light is not a wave of air, though, then what's waving? Clearly there must be something left in the jar, even after we've apparently removed everything from it. Whatever this something is, it must be everywhere, since light can travel everywhere, even in the vast emptiness between the stars. This stuff, whatever it is, has historically been called the ether. Now, you may be aware of certain arguments against the ether, and I'll address them in a moment, but for now, let me show you just how important this really is. To do that, I'm gonna give you a brief survey of all of the physical phenomena that we're aware of so far. First, observations of quantum phenomena have shown us that the particles that make up matter, say protons, neutrons, electrons, are all somehow wave-like, or they have a field-type nature. So for example, if you shoot electrons through a pair of slits, they will interact with one another in the same way that waves do. Number two, the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions, certain forces between matter, are also mediated by particles. Photons mediate the electromagnetic force, gluons mediate the strong force, etc. These particles also have a wave-like or field-like nature. Thirdly, gravity is also a field, creating an attractive force as well as changing length and time measurements. And as the LIGO experiment recently discovered, there can even be waves of gravitation. This short but broad list exhausts all of physics. All known physical phenomena are simply combinations of these fields. A hydrogen atom, for example, is a proton field surrounded by an electron field. So apparently, all physical phenomena are fields. Now, what is a field? A field is a property with different quantities at different locations. For example, the electromagnetic field is a property which determines how much force a charged object will experience at a given location. So a field's a property. Now, think of it this way. A property must be a property of something. Nothing doesn't have properties, so there must be some thing, some medium, that exists everywhere. That's the argument for the ether. The existence of fields requires a medium. Just as sound is a changing property of air, the pressure, these different fields are changing properties of the ether. Maybe the real path towards a grand unifying theory is to understand the nature of the ether and how it gives rise to these different fields. Now, many of you are probably saying, hold up, hold up, James, before you get carried away, didn't the Michelson-Morley experiment disprove the ether? No, let me show you. For those of you unfamiliar, the Michelson-Morley experiment was an ingenious experiment conducted in 1887 to measure the speed the Earth traveled through the ether. In this experiment, light was shot out of this emitter and passed through a beam splitter. A beam splitter is an optical device which allows half of the light to pass through it while the other half is reflected. This will create two separate beams. Each of these two beams is reflected off of a mirror so that it's then brought back to the beam splitter. Now, once this happens, part of beam B is reflected off the beam splitter while part of beam A is transmitted through it, which brings A and B together at the detector at the bottom of the diagram. Now, because these beams are waves, they will cancel and strengthen one another in a pattern which looks like this when they overlap at the detector. Now, the Earth moves really fast around the sun. So the Earth should be moving through the ether, which would cause an ether wind to blow through this setup. 
Now to keep things simple, let's say that the ether wind is blowing along the direction of beam B. If this were the case, then beam B would be traveling upwind at first, then downwind after it reflects off that mirror on the right. Since light is a wave of the ether, beam B would be slowed down as it moves upwind and uh, sped up as it moves downwind. Now doing the math, this all has the overall effect of slowing down beam B. So overall, going back and forth, it takes longer as a result of this wind. Now, after recording the pattern in the detector, Michelson and Morley then rotated the table that the experiment was mounted on. This would cause a change in the speed of both A and B, since each would now be going in a different direction with respect to the ether wind. This will make A and B each be in a different part of their wave cycle by the time they reach the detector, which will cause a measurable difference in the pattern they make when they combine at that detector. In this way, Michelson Morley planned on measuring the speed of the ether wind. This experiment required painstaking precision. Michelson actually suffered a nervous breakdown while trying to conduct the experiment. And after all of this effort, they detected nothing. Michelson and Morley tried a number of tricks, but they couldn't get this apparatus to detect motion through the ether. Modern physicists have taken this as, as proof that there is no ether. However, this simply isn't the case. First, and most importantly, this experiment doesn't explain how waves can exist where nothing is waving. So I want you to keep that firmly in mind, that that's the ultimate argument for the ether, is that something has to be waving. But second, it's worth noting that the physicist Heinrich Lorenz was actually able to explain this negative result using the ether. Using Maxwell's equations of electricity and magnetism, Lorenz calculated that the electromagnetic field produced by the atomic nucleus would change depending on the nucleus's state of motion. This change in the field of the nucleus would change the circular orbit of the electron into this elliptical smashed orbit like this. Now, since Michelson and Morley's table is of course made out of atoms, this would cause the table to get smashed by this exact same amount, shortening the distance that beam B must travel. Now, upon doing the calculations, Lorentz found that the change in length of the table along the direction of the ether motion would shorten the path of the beam just enough to cancel the amount that the ether wind would slow that beam down, making it appear to be going the same speed as the unaffected beam. Now, today, of course, we know that length contraction is real. Contrary to the normal narrative that Michelson Morley disproves the ether, Lorentz actually discovered length contraction before Einstein by using the ether to explain the Michelson Morley experiment. So, if Lorentz discovered length contraction, then why is Einstein the one who's remembered for it? Einstein ditched the ether and instead derived length contraction from the assumption that light is measured to be the same speed for all non-accelerating observers, regardless of their speed. The way this assumption is usually explained is that if you take two observers, one stationary, another on board a spaceship traveling at half the speed of light, and the moving observer shines a flashlight, then that moving observer will measure the light as running away from him at C, the speed of light. Now, common sense would then tell you that the stationary observer would observe the light moving at one and a half times the speed of light. But Einstein's assumption states that the stationary observer will also observe the speed of light to be going <laughs> at the same speed as the moving observer, that is C. Now, the way Einstein explains length contraction is by saying that this strange way that light is measured by different observers to be going the same speeds then requires those different observers to also measure different lengths. That's Einstein's way of explaining it with this assumption that the light, that the speed of light is always measured the same speed by different observers. So both Einstein and Lorentz's theories are consistent with experiments. But Einstein's theory was accepted on the basis that it made fewer assumptions. 
Instead of positing that length contraction and duration dilation are caused by a difference in motion through an ether that we can't even measure the speed of, all of the interesting effects of what is now known as special relativity could simply be deduced from these two postulates of Einstein's. That the laws of physics are the same for all non-accelerating observers, and that all of these observers measure the same speed of light. So the ether was never disproven. Physicists simply preferred Einstein's explanation that these effects were the result of the speed of light being measured as the same for all observers. But let's remember, the ether is not just a hypothesis. Its existence is already proven by the existence of fields. Remember, fields are a property at a particular location, and these properties can't be properties of nothing. Now, because they realize this on some level, modern physicists actually attribute these fields to something they call the quantum vacuum. But we got to remember the word vacuum means nothing. And it's not nothing. It's something. It has properties. Now, this isn't just a matter of semantics. So long as we say that these fields are properties of the vacuum, properties of nothing, then we can't ask what that nothing is. Nothing isn't something we can ask about. Alternatively, if we decide to call it an ether, if we decide to name it as something, now we can ask, what properties of this something, of this ether, cause it to carry these fields? Now, in an attempt to answer this question, we can make hypotheses about how the ether might tie these different fields together, might tie all of physical phenomena together. Here are a few hypotheses that you might be able to make right off the bat. Creation and annihilation uh, interactions of quantum particles show us that quantum fields are such that when they combine, they can create other quantum fields. So, for example, an electron and positron can be combined to create a photon. Conversely, photons of high energy can often change into an electron-positron pair in certain circumstances. This tells us, think about what this means for the ether. If all of these things are an ether waving, then this tells us that the ether can wave in different ways. It can wave in an electron way, a positron way, a photon way. And some of these manners of waving can give rise to other manners of waving. So perhaps these different conversions among these different waves will teach us something about the underlying properties of the medium which carries them. What properties might the medium have if it's able to wave in these different ways? And if some of these ways can give rise to other ways of waving? Let's turn our attention to gravity, which is the odd man out among the physical phenomena. Gravity, of course, bends the path of both light and matter. Now think about this. If light and matter are just waves in the ether, then perhaps gravitation is a bending, not of some abstract space-time, but of a very physical ether. If gravity is a bending of the ether itself, it would explain why it causes the path of ether waves, light and matter, to change their path. Perhaps this is the reason that physicists have been unable to quantize gravity for the last century. Perhaps it's because gravity is not a quantum field to begin with. Perhaps the quantum fields are some property of the ether, which is able to vary in the more and the less. It's able to wave. And gravity is a bending of the ether itself. Now, I have to emphasize, all of these are just hypo both of these are just hypotheses. But the point of presenting them to you is that thinking about the actual medium opens doors towards a deeper understanding of these phenomena. The true purpose and the real power of science is the ability to identify and control hidden facts which influence the phenomena around us. Early chemists were not content to simply document the different ways that chemicals can change. They went on to discover the underlying reason that they change because they are atoms that join into molecules. This deep knowledge has enabled us to enjoy custom materials, such as specialized polymers in cars, the semiconductors in computers, and catalysts, which speed the production of life-saving drugs. All of these are novel combinations of chemicals which would never have been discovered without understanding the fundamental way chemicals combine as atoms and molecules. 
Just as the chemists of the late 1700s were right to look for the underlying nature of chemical reactions, physicists today must seek to understand the medium which carries quantum and gravitational fields. If the atomic theory gave us mastery over matter, then just imagine what kinds of powers we will enjoy once we understand the medium which plays a role in all physical phenomena. What other evidence can we gather about the ether? What special methods will be needed to discover the nature of this elusive yet ubiquitous medium? These are some of the questions Inductica will answer in further videos. So hit subscribe to join me on that journey. I want to give a special shout out to Bruce who generally supports Inductica at $50 a month. To support the project, just go to patreon.com slash Inductica and make a pledge to receive donor-exclusive lectures. Thanks for watching.